messages sent during the pandemic about the former Health Secretary Matt Hancock. We'll have more on that in just a minute. But first, this report from our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. Does Boris Johnson tell the truth? All guidance was followed uh, completely during number 10. Denial after denial in the strongest possible terms. I'm sickened myself and furious about that. I've been repeatedly assured that the rules, that the order, rules order, were not order, broken. Order, order. These words were false, but did he know that? Whatever happened, uh, the guidance was followed and the rules were followed at all times. Those questions are what a committee of MPs is trying to answer. Did Boris Johnson knowingly mislead Parliament over Covid rule breaking in number 10? The first release of their evidence is not pretty for the former Prime Minister. There is evidence that the House of Commons may have been misled. A culture of drinking in the workplace in some parts of number 10 continued after Covid restrictions began. Mr Johnson failed to tell the House about his own knowledge of the gatherings. That is because there is evidence that he attended them. Breaches of guidance would have been obvious to Mr Johnson at the time he was at the gatherings. Which one were you? That's the one Yet still, yes. Mr Johnson claims he's innocent. Thank you. There's no evidence to show that uh, I must have known or I, I, I must have believed that uh, illegal events were taking place. It's because I didn't. And I thought we were fighting Covid to the best of our ability in very difficult circumstances in number 10 in the Cabinet Office uh, night and day. But new photos paint a somewhat different picture. Boris Johnson at events surrounded by people and alcohol. The MPs investigating him say he must have known this was breaking the rules. Those around Boris Johnson in number 10 were clearly worried about what was going on. In April 2021, so that's before the stories about what had happened emerged, one number 10 official wrote they were worried about leaks of the PM having a P star 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 up. And to be fair, I don't think it's unwarranted. For those who lost loved ones in the pandemic, the anger is personal. Lynn's husband, Gareth, died from Covid in March 2021. He is the leader of the country who should be setting an example to us, and I don't believe him. I think he knows he's at fault and he's trying to cover it up. For the next two and a half weeks, we'll be picking over the entrails of Partygate once more. What did Boris Johnson know and when? Could this be good news for Rishi Sunak and an opportunity to bury the past? Sam Coates, Sky News. Well, let's cross now to our political correspondent, Rob Powell, who's standing by in Westminster for us. Uh, hello again, Rob. I mean, certainly that interim report yesterday gave us an idea of the sort of line of questioning that uh, Boris Johnson may face before the committee later this month. How do you think uh, it's looking for him? I think it will be a bumpy encounter for him. And at the moment, I think Boris Johnson is down, but probably not completely out. I think the most damaging parts of that report for Boris Johnson were some of the WhatsApp messages that were published from uh, some of his closest aides, in which they seem to be struggling to find justifications for apparent rule breaking. I think what is not in there, though, is a cast iron message or a cast iron on paper proof that Boris Johnson absolutely 100% knew what was going on was against the rules, but told the Commons completely the opposite. And I think as long as there is that glimmer of doubt in there, Boris Johnson will continue to fight on. In terms of why this matters, as Sam was suggesting in his piece earlier this week, Boris Johnson really began his latest salvo against Rishi Sunak's Brexit deal. I think many MPs think that in the back of his mind he would still like to be Prime Minister again. Uh, the danger, I guess, for him is that this all flaring up again reminds a lot of MPs why they got rid of him in the first place. And Rob, more uh, WhatsApp revelations uh, regarding Matt Hancock dominating the front page of The Telegraph today as well. Yeah, and centred on two topics. I think the first is about the events that led to Matt Hancock's uh, resignation as health secretary, the affair he was found to be having with his close aide, Gina Colodangelo. Um, I don't think there's much in these extensive WhatsApp messages from the days after that story broke in the Sun newspaper that really adds much in material terms to what we know, um, other than that it is relatively late in the day that Matt Hancock and his team start contemplating basically fessing up and saying that he'd done something wrong. So uh, a kind of indication that politicians often don't admit that they've done something wrong until they absolutely feel 
that they have to. Potentially, though, the more newsworthy and more interesting part of the leaks published by The Telegraph this morning, though, is around the tension between Matt Hancock and Rishi Sunak over lockdown restrictions. One part in particular shows Matt Hancock um, warning the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, uh, that they have had lots of feedback that Rishi Sunak's Eat Out to Help Out scheme um, was causing problems in their intervention areas. Now, of course, that was Rishi Sunak's scheme to try and help hospitality. He was out on the airwaves defending it weeks after Matt Hancock sent that message. But clearly this shows there was concern right at the top of government that actually some of Rishi Sunak's schemes to try and help the economy was having uh, problems in terms of the health impact. OK, Rob, uh, for now, thanks very much. Well, sticking with politics and that investigation into Partygate, we can speak further to the Conservative MP Paul Bristow, who joins us live now. A very good morning to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, now, that interim report uh, that we, of course, heard yesterday found that Boris Johnson may have misled Parliament several times. It doesn't look good for him, does it? Well, I think we need to remember whose evidence that we're relying on here. This Privileges Committee is relying on evidence now, as has been proven, by uh, a report from the Chief of Staff of the Leader of the Opposition. I mean, that, this, this is just ludicrous. I mean, if it wasn't so serious, it would be laughable, relying on evidence from a report compiled by the Leader of the Opposition's Chief of Staff. I mean, I just think this makes a, makes a whole process look utterly ludicrous. Well, Sue Gray isn't yet uh, the Chief of Staff. And in, in fact, the, the committee did, did speak out uh, and defended themselves yesterday, saying that, you know, they, uh, the findings were not based on Sue Gray's report. And in fact, that it included a lot more evidence and many more photos. So, you know, you, you, can't, you can't say that this is down to Sue Gray's report. And in fact, the committee also complained well, that it was difficult to get evidence from Boris Johnson, well, well, which well, suggests he was obstructive. Well, hang on a minute. That's exactly what I'm telling you. And it's actually based upon their own words themselves. They say they rely on Sue Gray's um, report in, in the report that they've uh, published. So, so that, that's absolutely clear. At the end of the day, we're trying... This is a, um, a report which... One of the biggest seismic political events of the past 12 months. We had an MP, uh, a prime minister that was elected on a majority of 80, and we ended up getting rid of him on the basis of uh, a, a few photos of a birthday party, which looks, to be honest, not a very exciting birthday party. It makes us look utterly ludicrous to the rest of the world. Uh, and quite frankly, now, it's, I think it goes against all natural justice when we realise that it's based on a report produced by the chief, uh, leader of the opposition's chief of staff. I think the whole thing is ridiculous. Well, you can say that, but the Privileges Committee uh, who produced this interim report, the majority of the MPs on that committee were Conservative. Uh, and the report includes one witness saying that the then Prime Minister, of course, Boris Johnson, told a packed gathering at Number 10 in November 2020 that this is probably the most unsocially distanced gathering in the UK right now. Now, you, you can't dispute what, a, what an eyewitness has said, can you? Oh, well, of course you can. Have you seen a picture of it? A packed gathering. I mean, if this was supposed to be a party, it's probably one of the worst parties I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, the whole thing makes is a mockery of natural justice and makes us a laughing stock around the world. You know, I, I'm in Bulgaria right now, and I remember going to an event in um, with some school children, and all they had to tell me was Boris, 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 because they re they, they recognised what a world leader. Uh, th this person was. And the idea that we got rid of him because of a, a few soggy sandwiches from Sainsbury's is a complete joke. And again, it's um, evidence that this is based upon a report from the chief of uh, staff to the leader of the opposition. It just looks like a complete stitch up. I mean, I just don't understand prime why. Minister, do you think? No, I think he's continuing to fight this because it's a perversion of natural justice. Um, the, the idea, as I just keep saying to you, that this is based based on evidence from a report compiled by the uh, chief of staff to the leader of the opposition is just com is completely ludicrous. I think anyone who looks at this objectively would reach the same conclusion. And you say he's surrounded by bottles and everything else. If you look at these pictures and you're trying to make out that this is evidence of parties going on at Downing Street, it looks like the worst party I've ever been to in my entire life. It's, it's not a party. Anyone who looks at the pictures can, can see for themselves. The whole thing is ridiculous. 
Of course, Boris Johnson could potentially be sanctioned uh, following this uh, committee hearing. Um, do you think he could be suspended from Parliament? Well, I think if that happened, then we, we no longer live in a serious country. I mean, we, we've got, um, you know, you, you can sit there and you can turn around and say, well, you know, this happened, X happened, it's evidence of, of, of parties in Downing Street. I think anyone who empirically or, or independently looked at this evidence would, um, would realise that that's absolutely ridiculous. Boris Johnson was a prime minister elected by um, the overwhelming majority of the country, 80 seat majority. And um, the, the way his reputation has been besmirched, the way uh, this has happened, I think, is, is evidence of not a serious country. Uh, and the fact that it's based upon, as I say, evidence compiled by the leader of the opposition's chief of staff, I think, goes against all natural justice. Well, she's not the chief of staff yet. And it's she's not just... The job. It's not just Sue Gray. It's not just Sue Gray who investigated, is it? The Metropolitan Police also did, and they issued 126 fines. So, what do you say to that? Well, they issued 126 fines. That, that Boris Johnson didn't get 126 fines. The fine that Boris Johnson got was Nobody for got, one. The, well, got for the soggy sandwiches and the the slice of birthday cake. That I think, if anyone, as I say, looked at um, utterly uh, objectively, would think was ridiculous. Uh, and you know. You, I think the inconsistency in the police's approach, especially when you look at beer, uh, Keir Starmer um, swigging beers in a, at a curry in Durham, I think, um, uh, well, people can reach their own conclusions, can't they? What does the party need to do to move on? Well, we have moved on. We've got a new Prime Minister and uh, we're, we're getting on with the job. What I'm here to talk to, talk to you about is, um, is Boris Johnson. And uh, as I say, I think... Um, if we're going to keep continuing, continually going down this line, if we're going to continually uh, look to try and affect the reputation of a man who was elected on a, um, on a, on a major mandate, I, I just think that we're a serious country. A lot of people are today saying that his political future is in peril. He only has a very slim majority in his West London seat. How do you think the future looks for Boris Johnson today? Well, Boris Johnson will make his own decision about whether he wants to continue to fight. He, he, he said he's going to continue to fight. We can sit there and say we can look at his majority, we can look at my majority, we can say, well, that looks uh, pretty pretty um, perilous, doesn't it? But look, the, the people will decide, and I think uh, that, that's what's important. Look, Boris Johnson is a colleague, he's a member of uh, the uh, my parliamentary party. I hope that he continues to do so. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, and, and again, his, I think his reputation it absolutely needs to uh, be defended. He was elected on a, on a significant uh, majority, and I'm sure he'll continue to make a considerable impact on British political life. OK, Paul Bristow, it's been really good to get your thoughts today. Have a great weekend. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Now, 79 older people died every day.